So that's <clears throat> cultivator motivation. So one of the biggest hindrances to generosity <clears throat> is not wanting to part with the things that are mine. This is mine. So just for a minute, step back and who is the mine that possesses things? We feel very strongly this is mine, but who is that mind, or what is that mind that possesses things? So when we inquire and investigate who or what is the mind that possesses things, it's very difficult to locate something, to pinpoint something. And similarly, when we ask what makes something mine, it's also difficult to pinpoint things. We may come up with certain ideas, but probably not everybody agrees on what makes certain objects mine. <coughs> so understanding that can help us loosen our grasping, our sense of possession of things. And at first that uh, may be a little bit intimidating because we may feel, well, who am I if without all these things? But it can also be freeing in the sense that we don't need to cling on to things so much. And that makes generosity something that flows um, much more naturally. And so with that wish to gain really um, generosity that can give with all of our heart, then let's uh, generate the bodhicitta, the aspiration for full awakening, where we uh, do not cling to things. And yet that not clinging does not bring insecurity. It brings a sense of peace. So what makes something yours? So if you take my book and read it and don't return it, you're using it, that makes it yours. Okay, so you get to decide who uses it. That makes it yours. 
do you have the power to decide how everything you consider yours is used? <laughs> yeah, we might think we do. Yeah, but if you take a car, you say, well, I can control how the car is used until you're on the road and somebody else bangs into it. So I just moved into a cabin and, and now I think of it as like my cabin. I'm really like attached to it already. I've just moved in. But, but in thinking about that, it's just looking at the endless causes and conditions, you know, that brought that cabin into existence, been there for decades, and then brought me somehow there for, you know, it's like this confluence of all these innumerable causes and conditions that arise now and I have no idea when they're going to fall apart. Other causes and conditions will come and sweep all of that away. Yeah. So it just seems purely to be a question of karma, you know, whether it's my mala or... Yeah, it's definitely of. causes and conditions. Uh, but like the year before you moved into the cabin, was it yours? No, I, I don't even know who is living there. It's just, you know, it's, it's <laughs> so that cabin actually belonged to a lot of different people before you came to claim it as yours. Dan Black lived in it when he was a little kid, so he tells me, because his father worked for the Park Service. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so it's just, it's weird. Yeah. So what is it that makes it yours and just, not Dan's? I just label it that way. It's mine because yeah. I'm living there. And yeah. so, so just your label is necessary to make it no, yours. Yeah, it was. Uh, that's like her saying, "I use it. It's mine. I'm labeling it. It's mine." Yeah. Well, what about the person who owns it? Let's say you're you're renting it, and the person who owns it says, "No, it's not yours. I own it." There, there's a fictional landlord, you know, that I. It's part of, I work for them, so it, when, they're, when they don't want me to work for them anymore, it will no longer be my cabin. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh huh. I think it's mine when the previous owner agrees that it's mine. Only the previous owner? Yeah, so like if my boss agrees that I worked so many hours, then they will agree to give me a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. or the car dealership agrees that I gave them the amount of money that the car is worth. So then they, yeah, they, uh, they assume, you know, they say that now that car is yours. So it's an agreement between myself and the previous owner. Just yourself and the previous owner. What happens if the state comes in and says, uh, you need to pay taxes on it? Part of, yeah? Good point. <laughs> yeah, where, where is the taxes? Is it just you and, and, and that owner? That's it? Okay. It's an interesting thing to think about, and I think it's, it's very helpful to us to think about that because it, uh, it really loosens this idea of it is mine. Yeah, because when we say the word my or mine, we impute something on the object Yeah, that wasn't there one minute, but we impute it and then we think that it is the identity of that object. Okay. Uh, what's really interesting is... Um, Okay, take the land that, uh, you know, in North America in 1600. Yeah, uh, whose land was that? Did, did they own all of the land? Did they have a notion of every single square inch is theirs? Yeah. And, and how, who decided that that land was going to be called the United States of America? 
because at one point it was the the Native Americans' land. Then the British claimed it, and the French claimed it, and the Spanish claimed it, and then somebody said, "No, it belongs to the United States of America." Uh, who's the United States of America? Yeah, this entity was created out of nothing. Yeah, seriously. I mean, when you look, what what is the United States? Yeah, 500 years ago, it wasn't a United States. Yeah. So somebody dreamed up this thing, created an entity, and then said, this is ours. Yeah. We don't need to ask you for permission. We're just claiming it. But it's a made-up entity, isn't it? It's not something that has existed for centuries and so on. So it's quite interesting when we, when we really uh, start looking at things and how as soon as we give it the title United States of America, then whoo, all this conception comes on it, you know, of what that means. Yeah. Now, I remember being a kid, and uh, I don't remember what year Hawaii and Alaska were added to the U.S., but it was some time when I was a kid. Yeah, anybody know the year? Anyway, okay, so much for American history. Uh, <laughs> hey, you majored in that. What? 1959 for Alaska. 1959 for Alaska, okay. Okay, so, you know, before, they were just called territories. I'll, oh, both in 59, okay. So that before, they were both territories, and certain rules applied to them, like now with uh, Costa Rica. No, not Costa Rica. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Puerto Rico, yeah. Uh, yeah, the United States might want to claim Costa Rica too, <laughs> but uh, you know, why not? I mean, <laughs> um, uh, you know, of Puerto Rico. So one set of rules applied, and then a bunch of people decided to call it instead of a territory, a state. And then its whole relationship changed, you know, in terms of Hawaii and Alaska. And uh, Puerto Rico is sitting out there, you know, it doesn't have that same relationship. But it all depends on what people uh, vote, you know, and what other people do. You know, Washington, D.C., and those people don't, what is it, they vote in federal elections, but they don't get to vote in other elections. But they're the capital of the country. So in the capital of the country, the people don't have the full voting rights. That, that really makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So... It's very interesting when we start looking at things and how when we label things mine, uh, they help us create an identity. Yeah, These things are mine, therefore I am this kind of person who does this kind of things and enjoys this kind of stuff, you know? And, and our possessions become like a... Uh, the outer thing of introducing people to me because they can look at my possessions and then they get an idea of who I am and I look at my possessions and get an idea of who I think I am. But where is this ownership and what makes something mine? Okay. So just, you know, think about this 
and see if it can help you maybe relax a little bit about your stuff. Yeah. Because it's interesting when somebody takes our stuff without asking permission. Oh, you know, we feel violated. It's like, they came in my house, my space. Yeah, these, these uh, uh, square yards of nothing are mine. <laughs> and you can't come in them. And if somebody else does, then I get very upset. And if they take something and then label it theirs, I get even more upset. But they say, you know, if somebody steals our stuff to help that person not create so much negative karma, you mentally give it to them. Yeah. Now, do you want to really give them that? Yeah. They took your broken down plates, yeah, that you don't use, but they sit there in your break front, and they were passed down in your family for the last who knows how long. Yeah. You don't use them. You hardly ever look at them. But somebody comes in, maybe with their kid, and the kid breaks your plates that belong to your family that have been passed down to you. We are upset. Yeah. So interesting how our mind works, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, let's look at the questions. <clears throat> okay, so the, the questions have one, this story about Par, uh, Shariputra was quite potent. You know, people are asking questions about it. So what about losing the eye? <laughs> <laughs> How does one lose an eye in the right way? You know, I'm taking my eye out and giving it to that beggar. How do I do that in the right way? Well, I would say uh, you would, the right way would, I don't know the right way, wrong way, a way to do it. You know, I'd probably go to a doctor first, <laughs> have surgery, and, you know. But aside from that, just the changing the mind to, to be able to lose the eye, give the eye away, um, I think entails some understanding of emptiness, of the nature of reality, so that we, uh, we really see in our own experience that, that the eye isn't me, and it actually isn't mine. In fact, this whole body that I say is mine, yeah, actually came, it belongs to my mom and my dad and all the farmers who grew all the food I ate. Yeah? Otherwise, what, what about this body is mine? We feel mine, but if you unzip it and open it up or take a scalpel to it and open it up, are you going to find a tag that says this belongs to duped and children? Yeah. Okay. So uh, it sounds like self-harm. Okay, so we have to understand the point of this story. Uh, 
the point of the story, because and, and this happens a lot with the stories that we find, is they're making one point, but in telling the story, they bring up a whole lot of other things that we assume are also the meaning of the story, but they aren't, okay? Because it's true, if you look at it just from a conventional way, somebody asks for your eye, you give it to them, and they stomp on them, you know, it sounds like, oh, what, what kind of fool are you giving them your eye? You know? Why didn't, why didn't you know better? Why didn't you check out? Well, he actually did. Shariputra said, you know, what do you want it for? And the guy just didn't answer that part. Okay, but the point of the story is not, uh, isn't, is Shariputra harming himself or not? The point of the story is that he uh, had, he didn't have a strong, uh, th this grasping at mine, okay? He didn't have that so strong that he, uh, that, you know, he could give it up, okay? Yeah. For, forget giving our eye to somebody. Yeah. See, the stories, the stories often use something really drastic to illustrate the point they're making. Like you have so little attachment to your body, so little clinging to your body, that if somebody wants your eye, you can give them your eye in the same way that you could give them a carrot. You know, that's how much it means to you. That's what the, the story is trying to get over to us, is, you know, uh, he didn't have so much, you know, like this mine. I'm not going to give it to you. Okay. So, so talk, you know, getting us to focus on that. That, yeah. So self harm, uh, being s stupid about giving things away. That's not the point of the story. The point was, uh, he was. The point actually is that Shariputra made a big mistake, uh, in abandoning his bodhicitta because of the actions of the beggar. That's the point of the story, yeah. And then if you look behind that, you know, if, why did Shariputra do it? He didn't have much attachment to his body. And the beggar kind of, you know, knew he was a monk and probably, you know, meditating on uh, you know, non-attachment or meditating on non-self. Non and so the, the beggar, you know, again, it's, it's like a straw man in the story. And uh, so the beggar challenges him and said, well, wait a minute, you're a monk, why don't you give me your eye? And then Shariputra said, well, yeah, he's right, I better do it. But the, the point is don't give up your love and compassion for all beings. Okay, does that? Okay. Next question. What room is there for inquiry with generosity? Seems it would have helped for Shariputra to ask the man what he needed an eye for before giving it to him. <laughs> You're right. And I think he did that in, in the story. Yeah. <clears throat> but the guy didn't answer it. He just said, you know, if you were really, you know, some kind of true monk, you would, wouldn't have attachment, would give it to me. Okay, now what about uh, this for those of us who cannot just, uh, you know, hand over whatever to whoever says something? Um, I think it is quite good to, uh, to inquire about how a gift is going to be used. Yeah. Let me finish reading the question so I, I can answer it all, all at once. Is it appropriate to inquire about the purpose of solicitation before giving? Yes. Who are we to decide whether the purpose is worthy. Yeah. 
you use your own wisdom. Okay, so yes, I think it's very good to investigate if somebody is asking us for something to see what it is going to be used for. Okay, uh, you may have a relative that has a substance abuse problem who comes and asks you for money. Okay, now a Mickey Mouse generosity is oh, somebody asked me for money, here's a million dollars. I have no attachment. Yeah, I'm just giving with no clinking. So here's a million dollars that you're giving to the person who has a substance abuse problem. Is that compassionate for that person to do that? Are you benefiting that person? What about if they say, you know, give me $20 or give me $50 and you know that they're going to go out and use it for drinking and drugs. Is it compassion to give it, give them the money? Is that helpful to them? No, it's not. Now, they may throw a fit, and they may say, you're my brother, sister, cousin, aunt, uncle, mother, father, whoever you are. You're related to me, and you should have compassion for me and give me the dough. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you have to. Yeah. Compassion sometimes means that uh, you know you're willing to risk somebody not liking you, yeah, in order to protect them from their own worst instincts. Yeah. Now, if you're somebody who's attached to reputation, yeah then it's difficult. And, you know, your relative is saying, oh, come on, you know, I love you, you love me, we were so close as children, and, you know, I'm just going to go out and I'm going to buy some granola with it. Yeah, and you're going, yeah, right. Okay, and you say no, and they get mad. Now, are you comfortable in your decision? Or do you go, oh, no, somebody doesn't like me. They're mad at me. I should have given it to them so that the, I don't like when other people don't like me. Every, my, one of my rules of the universe is everybody must like me. So if somebody asks me for something and I say no and they're mad, something's wrong with me that they don't like me. I better go and give it to them. Because I need everybody to like me. You don't care beans about the other person, whether what you're doing is beneficial or not. You only care about how do, what do people think about me. Okay, so, uh, you know, giving in that kind of situation would be the Gener the generosity of a demon, yeah. The demon being attachment to praise and reputation, yeah. Okay. It would actually be much more helpful, you know, your relative asks you for money, you know, you know they're going to spend it on something unwise. You say no, but I will take you to a detox center, and I'll pay for that. Then you see what they say. Yeah. They may really get mad at you still. What? Are you saying that I'm an alcoholic? Are you saying I'm dependent on drugs? You know, why don't you mind your own business? Yeah, they could say that. Yeah. Are we comfortable with that? Or are we going to give them what they want? Okay. So my cat, you know, she likes to ask for food a lot. But I only give her little bits at a time. Because she does, if, she, if I give her too much, she throws up. So I give her little bits. Um, but 
but uh, she usually wants more. And I give it to her, but not too much so that she throws up. Okay, because guess who has to clean it up? Okay. So I don't know if she's, she's mad at me. She doesn't growl at me when I say no. She likes me much better when I say yes and give her something. Yeah. But I have to, you know, look out for her welfare. That's part of my responsibility. Okay, next question. <clears throat> if I am not awakened enough to practice non-corrupt generosity in some parts of my life, is it better... Sorry, I should put my glasses on. Is it better or worse than no generosity? Okay. So I can't practice non-corrupt generosity, I, my, my, you know, I want something from giving. So should I still give even though my motivation isn't pure or should I not give because I have a corrupt motivation? Okay. I think here it depends on the situation. Yeah, very much depends on the situation. If Okay, I'm not talking politics. I'm going to say, tell something. People accuse me of, ta not ta of talking about politics. I'm talking about ethical conduct. Okay, so somebody just said, I won't tell you who. <laughs> somebody just said that if uh, that he is supporting the uh, legal payments of many of the people who got arrested for January 6th. And he also said that if he runs and if he's elected, he will give pardons to all those people. So he's practicing generosity of money and he's practicing generosity of pardons. Okay? Now, what kind of generosity is that? <laughs> is, is that even generosity? <laughs> yeah. No, that's totally rotten to the core. You know, it's, it's kind of equivalent to buying votes. Yeah, completely rotten. So... You know, are you going to support that kind of thing? Because, uh, you know, I want to be generous just like that person. Well, I don't have the power to give pardons, but I can give money to people who, you know, broke into the Capitol and beat up the police and, and destroyed property. You know, that's generosity. Yeah, so just... You know, in those kinds of things, and you're doing it, well, you know, why? Why are you doing it? Because you want something from the other people. Yeah. You want their vote so that you will be more powerful. Yeah. That kind of generosity, you know, it's corrupt generosity, like this question asks. Should you do that one, or is it better not to do it? Okay, it, that one, it is better, don't be generous in that way. Okay? Yeah, that's, not, that's not true generosity, it's, you know? Okay. In another situation, okay, it's, uh, you know, it's somebody's birthday. Yeah, it's, you know, your mother or father's birthday, or mother's or father's Mother's Day or Father's Day. And you know that your mom or, or dad, they expect something. Yeah. Yeah, because it's Mother's Day or Father's Day. So, you know, I'm a mother, I'm a father, I have kids, you're a kid. 
you know? <laughs> um, isn't there something in this relationship that maybe you should, you know, acknowledge? Okay. So you feel a little obligated. You feel obliged, you know. You don't really feel like going out and, and getting a, a Hallmark card or, you know, doing something like that and, and writing, you know, something, you know, that will make them feel good. You don't really feel like doing it. Yeah. And you feel kind of obligated. It's Mother's Day, Father's Day, I better do it. Yeah, if I don't do it, I'm never going to hear, hear the end of it. Yeah. So, you know, you drag yourself away from the, the football game, get up off the couch, you know, go and, and uh, you know, you don't go buy a card, but you go and you pick up the phone and you talk to mom or dad. Okay? Yes, you feel obliged. It would be much better if you thought, wow, my mom and dad really went through a lot raising me. Yeah. Do, you, do you think you were an easy kid to raise? Yeah. Do you think your parents yeah, just said, oh, what a beautiful child. They never threw up. They never cried and woke me up in the middle of the night. They never did the opposite of what I told them to do. They always brought home good grades. Everybody else praised them. Yeah, they were so well mannered. I never had to correct them. Yeah, were we that kind of kid? When you think of it, you know, my goodness, what our parents went through. And that was the examples I gave just when we were little kids. Imagine when we became teenagers. Would you want to be the parent of yourself when you were a teenager? Huh? So <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if you think about this, then you might think, you know, Mom and Dad really did a lot for me. It would be nice if I, you know, called or I dropped them a card just to acknowledge what they did for me because usually I don't even think about that. I, I take it all for granted. Okay? So you may have started out with, oh, I don't feel like doing it. But then you think about it, you know, and your motivation changes. Or maybe your motivation didn't completely change and you still feel an obligation. Still, it's a nice thing for, to do for mom and dad. Yeah, it doesn't take very much energy. It makes them happy. Yeah. It might make us even reflect on their kindness. Yeah. So something good may come out of it. And it gets me off the sofa, which in itself is good. Rather than, okay, so is uh, corrupt giving uh, better than or worse than not giving? It really depends on the situation. Okay, any other questions about any of this? You know, I never really took the time to think of my parents as kind. I always thought of them, they won't let me do this, and they won't let me do that. And they expect this from me, and they expect that from me. And it wasn't until I met Buddhism that I uh, started thinking about their kindness. And I actually uh, wrote them letters and, and uh, said, thank you for being my parents. My mom said she cried. I don't know about my dad, but, you know, I think he liked it. <laughs> okay. So now Nagarjuna is talking about um, three hindrances to giving. What are the three hindrances? Self, recipient, and gift. Wait. 
how can those be hindrances to giving? Those are what needed for giving. It's the wrong view of the self, the recipient, and the gift that is a, hin a hindrance. So he says, if in giving there exists the three hindrances involving the conceptualization of an I who gives, an other who receives, and of a valuable object which serves as the gift. Okay, so if we have strong conceptions of those three, then one falls into a demonic mental state wherein one has not yet left behind multiple difficulties. Hmm. What kind of difficulties could arise from thinking, I am giving you these post-its, which are extremely valuable. Yeah, and they're orange, and they're beautiful. They match your robes. Okay. So what kind of problems are going to come from having that kind of attitude when giving? Line of arrogance. There's a big I who's being so super kind. What a hmm? yeah attachment and what kind of regret? Yeah, because these are my precious post-its that. Well, they match your robes better than they match mine. But kind of they match my robes. But I just gave them away to somebody. Now, of course, I need them. Yeah, I just gave them away. Now I need them because I need to mark up all the other places in the book of the sections I'm going to teach. But I gave up these post-its. And uh, for the life of me, there's no more post-its. Yeah, the whole universe. Or maybe there is in town, but I can't go to town. So I want my post-its back. But it's not very polite to say, you know, please give me my post-its back. I made a mistake in giving them to you. So that's not very po polite, is it? So then... I sit down and I fume about it. Why did I give that person my, my precious post-its to them? I gave it to them and it's theirs. Why in the world did I do that? I regret that. Okay. So, so then, you know, you mull around with that for a while. And then you think, well, how can I get them to give the post-its back to me without my asking them to return my gift? Then you ponder that for a couple of hours. You know, I could say, what could I say so they would give me the post-its. Oh, I could say the Dalai Lama needs some post-its. Yeah? And, and uh, you know, so give me the post-its. I'll send them to the Dalai Lama. That way I'll get my post-its back. Yeah. Then that becomes a big problem. I lied, and then I'm stealing. That's not so good. Okay? So do you, do you see what happens when there's very strong grasping at a big eye yeah, who is so generous with this extremely valuable gift that I'm giving to some other person who is inherently undeserving of it? 
You're complaining. <laughs> okay. So uh, here, what it's talking about is grasping the agent, I, the object, the recipient, and then we say the action, but here the action means the gift. Yeah. We're grasping those as inherently existent. We're solidifying them. And when we hold things uh, solid like that, it creates a lot of problems for us. Yeah, because even if we try and give, our mind is very much stuck to, to the object. Yeah. And we expect something in return. Okay. In the case of giving as performed by the bodhisattva, it is characterized by three kinds of purity through which there is an, an absence of these three hindrances and through which one has succeeded in reaching to the far shore. It is such uh, as is praised by the Buddhas that it, this is what is meant by the perfection of generosity. When there's not a strong I, there's not a strong other, there's not a strong notion of a valuable gift that is being given. They say that uh, at the Buddha's time, there uh, was one old lady who was very stingy. Yeah, so stinginess, miserliness, it's a big hindrance to being generous. And, uh, and she had very difficult, a lot of difficulty parting with anything. So the Buddha taught her to take a carrot and from, give the carrot from one hand to the next hand, and then give it back. So she practiced giving with the carrot from one hand to the other. Actually, I think that might have been my previous rebirth. Yeah? Until she learned that it can be another hand out there. Okay? So until it became that there wasn't so much attachment to ma, me giving it this hand, I can give it to another hand. So that's the, you know, he's, he's giving one example of what he calls the perfection of generosity. Okay, so these six paramitas enable a person to cross beyond the great sea of defiled attachments associated with miserliness and the other afflictions, thus allowing him to reach the far shore. It is for this reason that they are referred to as paramitas, or perfections. Then he goes into a whole section about uh, what is the difference in generosity between when uh, the, the person who's giving is someone who is aspiring for their own liberation, like Shariputra at the end of the story, between that person giving and a bodhisattva who's aspiring for full awakening, giving. Giving. What's the difference between those two? Okay. There still, still could be, you know, your precious sugar-free cough drop. Yeah. And what's the difference between that being given by somebody aspiring for their own liberation versus a bodhisattva who's aspiring for full awakening so they can benefit all sentient beings, giving the same thing to the same person. Okay. So he asks that question, and then he answers his question. Okay, And he says yeah, that... The person who is 
aiming for their own liberation uh, as a result of giving, you know, they will, that isn't the only cause, but it will contribute to the causes for their attaining their own liberation. A bodhisattva giving, it, you know, that uh, act of generosity will become part of the collection of merit that enables them to become a fully awakened Buddha. Okay, so there's a big difference between these two results. Yeah, because somebody who's a bodhisattva who becomes a Buddha can be of much greater benefit than the people who are looking only for their own liberation. Okay, so that person who aims for full awakening yeah, has a much uh, purer, you know, it's not that the other, the other person's motivation is impure. It's not. It's a good motivation to get want to get out of samsara. But the the motivation to to want to get out of samsara to benefit everybody, not just to have your own liberation, is far superior. And so to create the causes for that kind of nirvana is uh, is the difference between those two people giving because the motivation with which they are giving is different. Okay, is that clear? So this is why we are constantly generating bodhicitta throughout the day. Yeah. If, if you stay here at the, live, at the uh, abbey, you will see this all the time, you know, because uh, in morning meditation, before the end of morning meditation, we recite the monastic, the prayer for the monastic mind. Then we have uh, breakfast, other prayers also in, uh, involving generosity, offering to the three jewels. Then we have a stand-up meeting, and we recite a verse after that, you know, of offering with a good motivation. Before lunch, more prayer. You know, all throughout the day before any activity, we take the time to sit and really reflect on, on the motivation. And that makes a big difference in your life. Actually, it starts at the beginning of the day. And this is uh, a practice that, that I highly recommend to you, is when you wake up in the morning to make your first thought, yeah, not where's my coffee, and not what jerk do I have to talk to at work today. Um, but make your, your first thought in the morning, you know, what is the most important thing I do today? Yeah. One is not harm anybody. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Everything else is second to that. Yeah. Most important thing, I don't harm anybody. Yeah. There's more than one most important thing. Another most important thing is that I benefit others as much as I can. So you generate that motivation. You can be still lying in bed and thinking about this. Yeah. And then you think, and I want my love and compassion and bodhicitta to grow today. I will do what I can to make those increase. Yeah. And then, if you really want to, you could say, and I will practice seeing things as not being solid, you know, as being composed of, uh, of parts, you know, of not having intrinsic identities. And so you generate that motivation first thing when you get up in the morning. Yeah? And if you do that, it makes a difference in the whole day. And so he says, uh, as for that giving which is performed by the bodhisattva, it is done with the realization that the act of giving is neither produced nor destroyed. It is conducted in a state which has gone beyond the uh, afflicted impurities. It is unconditioned and it is characterized by being like nirvana. That giving is performed for the sake of all beings. This is what is referred to 
as the perfection of generosity. Okay, so Bodhisattva's generosity is done with the realization that the act of giving is neither produced nor destroyed. What is he talking about? Yeah, the act of giving is produced. Look, it's arising. I'm producing it. I'm giving this. Okay. It, he's not saying on the conventional level that giving doesn't arise. He's saying on the ultimate level, when we apply analysis to what is the action of giving, and you try and identify actually what the action of giving is, it's very difficult to come up with what the action of giving is. Okay? So I give this, you know, we usually, conventional level, okay, we imagine somebody's out there. I give that to that person. Yeah? I say, I gave, gave it, he received it. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. It's fine. But what does it really mean? I give this. Yeah. When does the giving occur? Does the giving occur when I pick up the gift? When I move it towards the recipient? When they grasp it? Which is actually the act of giving? There's different parts in there. I pick it up, I move it, they hold it. What about if they don't hold it and I put it down in front of them? Is that still the act of giving? Or do I have to put it in their hand? What actually is the act of giving? When we dissect it, and like at what moment does giving occur? If we say, well, it, it occurs, yeah, the act of giving occurs when somebody holds, the recipient holds the object. Well, if you say that, that that's the act of giving, then my picking it up, my motivation, my moving the object has, is not the action of giving. So if you can identify one thing that is it, then you're eliminating all the other parts, all the other causes and conditions from being the act of giving. And that doesn't work. Okay? But what it does, doing that analysis, does get us to see is that the act of giving, you can't really nail it down. And maybe that's a good thing, that we can't nail it down. Because if we nail things down, they often become harder to do. But if we just say, okay, ultimate level, we can't really identify what the act of giving is, but conventional level, yeah, giving is a good thing. So, somebody accumulated merit by giving, somebody receives something that is useful. So he's making us analyze more what does it actually mean to give. And uh, it, it becomes very difficult to find uh, uh, definitions of these things that you can say, this exactly is it and nothing else. Yeah, But that opens us to a whole new way of viewing things, Yeah, if we cannot pinpoint them in that way. Makes things much more fluid. Okay? Then again, the bodhisattva gives for the sake of the Buddha's dharma. The dharma of the Buddha is immeasurable and boundless. So too, then, is that giving also immeasurable and boundless. So that's also another reason it's called the uh, 
perfection of giving. Because when we give in order to sustain the existence of the Buddha's teachings in the world, we are benefiting all the sentient beings who can benefit from learning these teachings. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at first you may say, well, so what? <laughs> no. But when, when you really uh, get into the Buddha's teachings and they see, and you begin to see how um, profound they are and how if you really practice the antidotes to the disturbing emotions, they work and you're happier and things around you go better. And when you die, you don't have any regrets. You know, when you see that from your own experience, then, uh, and you care about other living beings, then you want to preserve the teachings so that other people have access to them. <laughs>